everyone. Today we have some very special people joining us on the Intake Podcast. Today she is co-hosting with me for the first time. So Chumky, welcome. I'm so happy that you're with us today. Thank you, Catherine. It's my honor to be with you today and an honor to co-host with you. Thank you so much to the association for creating this important platform for us. Uh, we're really happy to have you with us. She works for the ASPCA as a senior director of the Northern Tier Shelter Initiative and focuses on community collaboration, mitigating pet homelessness. She joins us today in her capacity as board president for the Association of Shelter Veterinarians. We will be interviewing Dr. Michael Blackwell, who has had a long career of public service. Like his father, he earned a Doctor of Veterinary Medicine degree from Tuskegee University. Currently, he serves as the director of the Program for Pet Health Equity at the College of Social Work at the University of Tennessee. His mission is to improve access to veterinary care, especially for families with limited means. He also chairs the Access to Veterinary Care Coalition. Dr. Blackwell has received numerous awards and recognitions, most notably the Distinguished Service Medal, which is the highest personal honor award of the U.S. Public Health Service. He was twice awarded the Surgeon General's Exemplary Service Medal. He currently serves as a member of the Humane Society Veterinary Medical Board of Directors. And just a few months ago, he received the Avanzino Leadership Award for 2020. It's an honor for us to have Dr. Michael Blackwell join us. How are you doing? Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here today. And I guess I'm going to owe Chomke something. I'm not sure what what she's going to charge me for this, but Chomke, I will send the payment. Uh, appreciative of being able to participate in your program today. Absolutely. Well, Chomke, I'm going to turn it over to you. I'm giving you full control. Wow. Okay. You won't regret it. Uh, Dr. Blackwell, thanks so much for being with us and answering some questions with us. I wanted to start off with acknowledging just your breadth of experience uh, and the important positions you've held in uh, our federal government. Uh, I won't list them all out because there are so many, but I wanted to see if you would share with us how your experiences in these various governmental positions influenced your work and your experience in your perspectives on access to veterinary care. Yes. Well, thank you for that question. <clears throat> I grew up in veterinary medicine. My dad was a mixed animal practitioner during my upbringing. And, um, and so I've been uh, all my life um, in a world with animals and the people associated with them, connected with them. Uh, over the years, I came to appreciate who we are as a people, as a country, as the United States of America. And along the way, I. I got to meet all these wonderful people, like in the sheltering industry, for example. You know, when I think of you, uh, our shelter veterinarians, and the many people who help their communities through animal sheltering, it is just a good example of what's good about this country. And, and we, we need to pause for a moment and acknowledge that because we live at a time of great difficulty and challenges in the country. So thank you for all you do and thank all of the listeners, uh, the viewers of this, this podcast uh, about uh, the work that you do. It's so important. I've been informed through the many experiences and very blessed to have had the experiences that I've, I've had. And really right now, I'm just trying to use uh, all of those blessings to give back. You know, what I've learned, uh, what skills are picked up, and uh, I appreciate the opportunities that um, I have to, to express that, that help to others. Thank you. Dr. Blackwell, I know that animal welfare agencies out there, they're often interested in the specific process needed to start something, to start a new program, how to roll it out, right? We talk a lot about the what, but it feels like sometimes we need to talk more about the how and the specifics to overcome kind of that activation barrier that seems so high when we're first starting something. So can you share, I was thinking that if you could share some updates or insights from a pilot community in which a line care is being implemented, 
how this community has started that work, what did it look like, how did it roll out, it could give some specific, uh, kind of paint a more specific picture around how y'all are working with these communities and what they're doing on their end. Sure. Every community is different. Let's start there. But there are commonalities among communities, and especially when we think in terms of animal welfare. When I look at every community in America, what I see is a spectrum uh, of socioeconomic groups, if you would. So extending from those who are in poverty all the way up to upper middle class and maybe even the wealthy. Um, as a country, as an industry, as a profession, uh, we do have to do more to support the families at the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum. And uh, that does mean organizing. Uh, and the reason we need organization and structures because we need the efficiencies that can be gained there given that it's such a large and complex issue. So when we start conversations with the community, we seek to identify some key partners. Clearly we need veterinary service providers who will provide the medical care for the uh, non-human family members. Oh, and by the way, I said non-human family members. Well, what is that? Well, they used to be called pets. Some still call them pets or, or animals. But when we look at our communities, what we see are bonded families. These are families that are made up of humans and non-humans. And that emotional bond is significant. And I think if we go about reaching uh, our families, understanding that it, this is a work about reaching families and not about treating animals or helping animals. And this is an important message to the shelter and industry that um, we historically have been animal centric. And while that's still important, we need to understand that the animals are, let's call them non-human family members, live in a context or they're connected. And even if they are um, uh, a resident of the shelter, uh, the shelter is seeking to connect them with the family. So this family centric focus is really, really important because then as we organize and mobilize within communities, we will make better decisions knowing that this is about families. So we identify veterinary service providers who want to help and I think most veterinarians probably would fall into, into that category, even though their practice or their business model may not be quite positioned yet to, to help in certain ways, but most are there. We uh, seek to identify um, animal welfare organizations that are interested in a collaborative structured approach. And we seek to identify social service agencies. Now that social service agency piece is extremely important because those of us in veterinary medicine and in the shelters across the country, by and large, are not trained to support humans. And so that means partnering with those individuals in the community who can assist their individuals and their agencies. We believe those three pieces are critically important then in improving our effectiveness in um, keeping uh, pets out of the shelter due to medically uh, treatable conditions, uh, finding resources for humans who um, want to hold on to their family member, they want to stay together, but they, they do have these real challenges. Um, and so again, each community is different, who the partners are may differ, but if we have this kind of collaboration going on, then I think we would do a better job going forward and we need to do a better job. Do you have any particular updates from any communities? So uh, the Align Care Project has, um, we, we're still in our pilot phase, but we had to start scaling up mm -hmm. or doing the work of scaling up because of COVID-19, uh, meaning a lot more unemployed uh, people out there, many more families in a position where they may be at risk of losing a family member to the shelter or 
premature death or whatever due to lack of medical care. Um, we are in uh, Asheville, North Carolina, Knoxville, Tennessee, Phoenix, Arizona, and Long Island, New York. We just started up in Las Vegas, Nevada, and have identified providers in Reno, Nevada. And we are starting up in Buffalo, New York. Um, so those are the cities that are where there is activity all already on the ground. Uh, in addition to those cities, there are as many more who are well into conversations with us about getting started. And so um, while we're completing our, pi our pilot, which ends in June of next year, we are starting that process of bringing more communities online with the line care. Got it. Dr. Blackwell, can I ask one more question? And this is uh, my curiosity. Is it a line care staff that is in each of these communities uh, finding those contacts, putting them together? Or do you have or, or do y'all require a kind of primary agency within that community to do all of this coordinating? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question and thank you for it. What we do as a staff, the program for pet health equity here at the University of yes. Tennessee is yes, we will uh, reach out to communities starting the dialogue. And often that conversation actually starts at a shelter or an animal welfare organization. Mm -hmm. For example, when trying to identify veterinary service providers. In most communities where shelters exist, those shelters also know which practices out there that have a, a real heart, if you would, for this mission and have been trying mm -hmm. to help. And that's a good starting place. So we will have those initial conversations. Now, um, that said, there are a couple of communities right now that have accessed our materials on, on uh, the internet and they are starting preliminary conversations. In fact, in a couple of instances, by the time they contacted us, they already had a sense of who they needed to invite to an initial meeting. Um, but we do try to be proactive in uh, not only bringing guidance, but in the case of social work, for example, or social service agencies, we may be better positioned to make that initial contact uh, and introduction uh, to the program. It does get very customized to the community mm -hmm. and what they're capable of doing and ready to do versus what we can do. I hope I, I'm answering your question. You are, you are, and it's some of these details that uh, are, are insightful to learn about because I think it, it hopefully helps some of our listeners out there understand what are the, the steps in trying to uh, work with the line care and or develop a line care type, type yeah. models. Okay. Yeah. I uh, can I think... tell you what's on the horizon. Mm -hmm. um, we, we do this somewhat now, but we are formalizing training. It'll be okay. a few weeks down the road, months even, before that's where we want it to be. But essentially, we will be uh, offering, you know, one hour training sessions, if you would, for the practices or the social service agencies or the shelters, because we need personnel, we need people in each of those locations within a community who really are informed about not only how the Align Care system works and can answer questions locally about that, but literally that training will uh, provide what we call human support training. So it's really about, about communicating around uh, sensitive issues or difficult issues, active listening and that sort of thing so that uh, we have more and more individuals within our communities with some form of training uh, in supporting the families. Wonderful. Thank you. That really helps. Thank you. Sure. Dr. Blackwell, I'm going to transition and ask about, uh, I'm going to ask the S question, the sustainability question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so sustainability discussions, they tend to arise when implementing subsidized programs. Can you share your thoughts in general when it comes to pet health equity and, and specifically Align Care around um, sustainability of subsidized programs? 
Uh, and then the second part is, for instance, one area uh, in access to veterinary care work that I think we're still we still need some creative solutions around is how to support those pet owners uh, with pets that have chronic medical concerns that need ongoing assistance. Mm -hmm. So some tricky, tricky kind of final frontier questions out there. Sure. Well, they're good questions. And uh, there's no one answer. Mm -hmm. I will simply say this. Sustain sustainability is possible, but it's possible to the extent that we do two things. That we structure a program that has the efficiencies that we're seeking to build and the predictability uh, and so forth so that communities then can align around a common way in which they're trying to support care. So let's look at it this way. Right now, throw a dart at the map and hit a community. And what we see here, we may have various groups that are trying to help, sometimes working at cross purposes, oftentimes duplicating effort, communicating, messaging with the veterinary community in ways that, are, that can sound contradictory or conflicting. And for the public, it's who do you help? This person, that person. So I think we'll always have citizens who are interested in a particular organization and they're gonna always wanna support that organization. That's a good thing. But what we are also seeing is as an industry, we need to get our act together so that what we present to the public in our, in our mind, the concept is it's a national healthcare system. Your community is one mm -hmm. piece of that system. And so as the public, and we, we do have people in our communities who are very compassionate souls and they want to help and they do help. We are simply building a way in which that help can be provided and again, with predictability and consistency, due diligence that the funds go to the families intended. And we're not regularly, constantly renegotiating fees and so forth with the veterinarians. That's where the efficiency part comes in. Check out charity models uh, still are a very significant way in which the public is, um, is able to help their causes. Um, as businesses are recruited to support a national health care system, they provide their patrons an opportunity mm -hmm. in small amounts because it's in mm -hmm. pennies, you know, few dollars that get rounded up at checkout. A lot of these small doses, of course, translate into significant funding. Uh, foundations, likewise, if they are what the industry has not done is made inroads into human health care and human support organizations. Making this family centric, we open up those channels as well of potential revenue to help support the non-human family members. Yeah. And of course, our long-term plans, uh, I won't get into because of our time, but um, there's a way to build sustainability if we do this in the structured, organized way in which we're going about it. Our ideas are not new. You can find them operating in many places. What's different is it's more on a global scale and it's not one organization trying to fundraise just for themselves, but as part of a collective. I'll finish on this one point. There are people who may be reluctant to donate to a single entity. They may not know much about them or they're not sure they agree with their mission. But I think there's something to be said about the willingness to support a national effort. Um, this is what happens in human medicine, although it's based on government programs and tax dollar resources. Mm -hmm. um, but we also have many examples in this country where the community itself is the, re is re re the reason those activities happen. The sheltering industry, perfect example. We have sheltering right. because the public wants sheltering. So we're simply saying that some of the resources that the public already provides need to keep the pets with their family members and therefore out of the shelter. It reduces the cost of sheltering. It reduces uh, many other impacts and it keeps the family together. 
So a combination of existing resources, not all of them, but some of them that are intended to ensure families are kept together, but being able to educate the public about their families, their neighbors, and a structured way in which they can help. That's how we get to sustainability, I think. That really helps. That really helps me understand um, or recognize that sustainability uh, has a different perspectives to it. And it almost sounds like we're trying to redefine this narrative around what it means to support uh, our community. And it's not that we're looking for tons more money out there. It's almost, you know, moving money around to have a more sustainable framework to that money. So it goes further. And I, I love how you've how you're trying to redefine that narrative for communities. Yeah, let me let me give you another agencies. Mm -hmm. Let me give you another example of how efficiencies would look. So right now, the biggest resource for providing medical care to non-human family members is the private veterinary medicine industry. The private practices that are in communities across the country, although let's admit there are service deserts as well. Mm -hmm. But let's just stay with the fact that resource is sitting there. Right. Now, a, a community could decide to build nonprofit organizations and put clinics into shelters and so forth. But what we've actually done now is duplicated the resources in that community and that therefore the infrastructure that must be maintained is even more expensive. Mm -hmm. So I'm a big believer that if you've got a resource sitting there called private veterinary practices, let's figure out a way to leverage them to help knowing that in, in their heart, they're already there, but they gotta be paid and they've gotta be paid predictably and it's gotta meet the bottom line or enable them to meet the bottom line. Instead of saying to the shelters, you need to hire more veterinarians and get clinics set up and, you know, so, so I think it's, it's connecting the animal welfare industry with the veterinary medicine industry in ways in which we leverage what each other is trying to do. What are we doing now? Well, the shelters are working in, in their silo and they negotiate out to veterinary practices. And that's where it starts to get dicey, quite frankly, because you're negotiating fees. And oh, by the way, this is happening while you got a crisis already mm -hmm. on hand. These things need to be decided up front. When, when there's a medical problem that exceeds the capability of the shelter, you, the next steps are already known. It, the person is referred to practice A over here because they are in the network. They know what they're gonna get paid for their services. So yeah. that that's part of the sustainability piece in, in, for, for certain. And I, I'm glad you, you asked the question because what things cost in part is because of efficiencies or not. <laughs> so, you know, you lower the cost of delivering services to the extent that you can improve efficiencies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to yeah. jump in for a moment here and just applaud the um, the efficiency model that you just outlined, Dr. Blackwell, because I feel like uh, for so many shelters oftentimes their outreach is during a um, time of crisis, if you will. Um, they are, uh, instead of already having a life-saving pathway in place for that animal. And so if we're talking about efficiencies, if you, you already know this animal needs critical care that is beyond what the shelter can actually provide, you shouldn't have to waste that valuable time trying to negotiate mm -hmm. and find that next step in their life-saving pathway. So I really uh, feel very passionately that that is uh, a model we should be all aspiring to in the sheltering world. Well, so okay. thank you for that example. Well, I appreciate what you, what you just said. And let's not lose sight of the fact that every minute, every 30 minutes, every hour that a shelter personnel person is off trying to solve this crisis. Yes. 
has taken away from work in the shelter. Now, I won't say that that's threatening other lives, but that's not out of the realm of possibilities. You know, every shelter I've ever visited, and certainly the one I worked worked in for, for some time, um, there there's not a lot of extra time sitting around waiting for you to go off and do other things. So yes, we need that already pre-figured out, pre-decided, and things just move into gear. Now, there will be exceptions, but the idea is minimizing those exceptions that demand the attention and right. time of the shelter personnel. Yeah. And it knowing the shelter personnel I've met over the years, I know exactly what they're going to do. They're going to drop everything they're doing that needs their attention, and they're going to save that life. <laughs> and, and so, bless their hearts, I just appreciate you know, the work that people do in the shelters, because that's exactly what happens in those instances. Yes, it's it's definitely been a, a long road, and we're you know we're we're a scrappy bunch of people, so we've yeah. worked hard <laughs> to get here. But it's uh it's I think it's an organic step in the evolution of sheltering is how to become um, more systems process systems and process process-based yes. oriented and how to do multiple uh, programs and operations in parallel instead of kind of peace peacemaking yeah that uh, I appreciate that keyword system taking a systems approach you know we can't really provide health care on a population level and we're talking about a population yeah. right now that's underserved to reach to provide health care on a population level requires a systems approach. And yeah, no one size fits all, but there are some common elements that every community must attend to if we're going to be, a, uh, if we're gonna realize those efficiencies we've been talking about, which mm -hmm. again, translates into lowering the cost. I, I could take two communities. Okay, community A is, the way things are done now and healthcare does get provided and community B is one where a system of providing healthcare has been developed. And I will tell you mm -hmm. the cost of delivering the healthcare, the same healthcare is different. The, the community without the systems approach is going to cost more to, divide, to provide that same care as a community with a system in place. And that's what we're trying to do is uh, facilitate the building of a systems approach yep. for what are very predictable things, right? We know pets are gonna get sick or they're gonna be injured. And there are their people are not ready to walk into any private practice and pay for it. We know it. that's the country we live in. That's the world we live in. So let's fix that. That's Let's do some front end thinking and and the, the experiences out of the shelter industry, we've pulled heavily up on those experiences. And mm -hmm. um, Dr. Aziz, you, 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 you've heard us refer to incremental veterinary care. Yes. Well, it's a tiered approach. It's, it's doing something to avoid doing nothing, but it's science based, it's evidence based. It's exactly what you do in a shelter every day. Right. It's not right. new, it's, but we need to standardize those decisions. Again, we gain efficiencies. And newer graduates of veterinary colleges will be able to uh, access information through time that will place them in a position to more readily make those decisions, even outside of the shelter in this case. What can we in shelter medicine and sheltering do to create systemic change around the lack of diversity and inclusion when it comes to student training, student exposure, and veterinary medicine. And I asked this uh, after your just response you just made, because I do feel that that's, that has to be part of our solution moving forward, that we, yeah. um, we need to train veterinarians to empathize with all, all types of pet owners, all communities yeah. of pet owners. And we what do. does that look like? What can we do? Um, the principle that drove uh, diversifying the federal government, mind you, I'm old enough that when I went to, to the federal government, we had quite a few women sitting behind typewriters, mind you. Uh, all of the people with positions, with titles were generally white males. 
and very few minorities in the mm -hmm. workplace. But a principle got embraced, and that was that the people's government ought to look like the people. And mm -hmm. that was the one principle that seemed to enable some to overcome the idea of, well, why do we have to do this? Or, you know, what, what is this all about? For our industry, I think that we sh the, a shelter, let's just stay with that, ought to reflect the community that the shelter mm -hmm. serves. Mm -hmm. So uh, why do we do that? Because it could be argued that a 100% white personnel or white staffing of a shelter could speak for a community of color. That's in the realm of possibilities. But I suggest that someone who can appreciate a community of color because they are a person of color would bring different kind of thinking and ideas to that operation and strengthen the effectiveness of the operation. So it's, it's a very practical thing, you know, am I going to go to a white, a white person and ask them to really be the expert and speak on behalf of a black person or a community of color about everything? Probably not. When I could ask someone of that community from that community to speak on behalf of that community. I like um, where you're going. I, I, I like where you're going in terms of reflecting our community. Uh, anything in particular in shelter medicine that you feel we can do to create yeah. more systemic change for students and the population of students and their exposure to, to, to more varieties of, or to incremental care too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, one way I could ask myself your question and I've done it many times, <laughs> How do we increase diversity in veterinary medicine? I mean, that, that's kind of one big old step in, in the direction of your question. And of course, a subset of, of that is, uh, how do we increase diversity in shelter and shelter medicine and, and so on and so forth. So veterinary medicine definitely needs to continue to address the lack of diversity for the reasons we said, uh, we serve a, a diverse nation that's increasingly more and more diverse, that's predicted. Uh, there's no real debate about uh, us becoming a more diverse nation. And so we need to um, ask ourselves, should we reflect the nation that we serve or the communities that we serve? But now to do that, this may surprise some, one of the biggest impacts that veterinary medicine could have is add our voice to initiatives around diversity. I say add our voice because we are a respected voice in most circles. We can influence public policy and, and uh, uh, legislation and so forth. And why do we need to do that? Because there's a pipeline, there's a supply issue. And it starts with a, a young person in a community with a not so strong public school system that's poorly supported and therefore they don't get a strong education, they are already at a disadvantage of being able to get to veterinary college. We have young people in communities that are faced with all sorts of other challenges, um, starting with housing insecurity and low, in, uh, low employment um, uh, rates and so forth, or high unemployment rates. And so there are these social issues not caused by veterinary medicine, but veterinary medicine has a role in helping to influence how this country goes about addressing, whether we care about it. Um, if you check the historical record, you will find that organized veterinary medicine has no track record speaking on social issues. Maybe it's mm -hmm. time Maybe we can be more effective in serving society if we are helping to steer society in the, in the places where our voices are important. So what you'll notice is I didn't give a simple answer to how we increase diversity because our lack of diversity reflects what is America. 
And what is America is a nation where there's always been any income inequality. There has been um, disparities uh, from health care to all sorts of needed services. And unless we add our efforts to addressing that foundation, we will still see a trickling of uh, diverse people into our profession. And that would be tragic. I can uh, share with you that the Association for Animal Welfare Advancement is committed to uh, this very um, effort. And we know it's a marathon and not a sprint. And you know I, our board of directors and our CEO has made this really our top priority in terms of being able to really make an impact in the animal welfare sector. One of the things that I've learned in this process, and I think this speaks to some of the points you just made, Dr. Blackwell. If I am a mother of a child um, and I'm living in a predominantly BIPOC community and my child, to your point, is going to a public school that is not giving them the education requirements that will enable them to pursue veterinary school, that's obviously one of the first hurdles, no question. One of the second hurdles is if I look at the income inequality across uh, the races in America, I very quickly realize that I want my child to go into a profession that's going to elevate them and create a sustainable income stream. Veterinarians are graduating from veterinary school with hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt and their income to debt ratio is preventing them from being able to procure a mortgage. So on the front end, there are barriers and on the back end, there are barriers. Absolutely. So if I am a mother of color, I am not gonna encourage my child to pursue a career that will, before they even start working, put them at such a deficit. And, it, it, and it speaks to just the whole system. It, this is complicated and it needs a major overhaul mm -hmm. and, yeah. and we need to be having these conversations. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Well, thank you, thank you for that because that is, that's really appreciating the, the complexity of the situation. And let me just say this, no one of us can point to a a really robust recruitment program in veterinary medicine. You know why? We've never had to recruit into veterinary medicine. Most of us came into this profession having made that decision at the average age of six to eight years of age, never let go of it. And so the profession, when you look at the veterinary colleges, there's never been a shortage in that pipeline. There are always, it's largely white females, of course, but that pipeline is there. So one of the things I've said to academic institutions for many years, and I'll repeat it today, um, real education, being a real educator, is when you can take a student who is not a straight A student coming in, but a C average student, but has every reason and all of the skill set necessary to be a very effective professional and turn that person into a professional. Um, to put it another way, the people who get admitted into veterinary colleges, most of them overwhelmingly, you just point them to the books and they self-educate. Now, I know some faculty members may be upset the way I put it, but I'm trying to make the point. These are well-educated people who are showing up. Okay, that's great. That's not broken. What's broken is whether our education system in veterinary medicine is geared toward a broader spectrum of students. And if we do decide that, yeah, uh, that child that you just referred to that's going to come out of that uh, school system and so forth, um, understanding why parents may steer them otherwise, but if they happen to be a veterinarian at heart, that six or eight year old, like most of us, 
then they're going to show up probably. The question is, do we want to get at those who don't even know they want to be a veterinarian? And that's a whole nother level. And that's where real recruitment really would be uh, necessary. So I'm a big advocate for us being more proactive as a profession. I spoke to having a voice on some of the social ills that, that uh, impact our ability to do what we need to do. But um, we need to ask ourselves a hard question. Are we going to be a passive profession, just take who shows up? Or in addition to them, do we really want to proactively train future veterinarians? And that means doing a number of things that we don't do today. Thank you. That is really important to talk about. Thank you. Dr. Blackball, we're jumping around to some big questions. The final question we had slated for you was, uh, there's a lot of new approaches, a lot of new ideas being talked about in veterinary medicine, uh, telemedicine, paraprofessionals, veterinary social workers. How do you feel that uh, these new ideas Sometimes they've been used, sometimes they've just been in the background, but we haven't fully discussed them. How do you think they fit into shelter medicine and sheltering to help uh, address different issues that are affecting our field, such as access to care, veterinary shortage, compassion fatigue? Yes, that's a, that's a really potent question and I appreciate it. So the lack of access to healthcare is complex and it's, and healthcare is expensive, whether it's human healthcare or veterinary care. Relatively, there, there are relative differences, mind you, but they are both expensive. I think all options should be on the table for improving access to care. Now, what's not new? What's not new is the need to do that because really when we look back 50 years ago, that's where human medicine was. Everybody had to go see a physician. Oh, and then there were nurses. But through time, more and more allied professions were established. Heck, right now you can go to a drugstore and get urgent care. Did you know that? <laughs> and oh, by the way, you looked at the placard, it wasn't even a physician. Mm -hmm. now, and we're talking about humans where they may be infants all the way up to elderly, so vulnerable individuals. Oh, you know what? You can go to the drugstore and you see all of these over-the-counter medications approved by the FDA as safe and effective for the intended purpose. And some of them are for infants or the elderly, vulnerable people. And you know what? We don't even think that's strange. What we have today is a profession that says, oh no, you've got to deal strictly with the DVM on everything. Now, that's a little bit of an overstatement, but it's not far from the truth. And then when I think of these options brought about by technology like tele, telemedicine, telehealth, you know, I remind people that the folks that we're trying to help are, are primarily the working poor. They're not indigent, you know, in poverty that, that just relies solely on the government. They're the working poor and they work in jobs that don't pay leave, sick leave. And so uh, when they take off to go to the vet for a suture check, as an example, they lose revenue and they lose money because they had to take off. Some actually have to go in their pockets and pay for transportation to get to the vet. For a five minute visit for someone to say, yep, suture line looks just fine call us if any, anything changes. We have people who can't afford that kind of health. They can't afford to work in a healthcare system like that. That's disadvantaging them on multiple fronts. So using technology to address what we can is important. Pushing for more over-the-counter medications. Yeah, I know many can't be over-the-counter, but antihistamines, I mean, uh, some pain medications that are labeled for, you know, we've not promoted, we've not encouraged companies to develop these over the counter. So we need to do multiple things mm -hmm. in order to lower the cost. And that includes mid-level professionals, licensed practical nurses, physician assistants on the other side, 
Oh, and pharmacists giving you a shot? I mean, did you know that pharmacists could stick you? <laughs> I got one, yeah. With something that could kill you because you could have an anaphylactoid reaction and nobody thinks that's strange. We, we can't serve society as 88,000 or 70,000 veterinarians that require everybody deal with us only. Now that doesn't mean we lose total control of our, our healthcare system. We, we, we need to make the proper decisions so that we can still steer that. But boy, we gotta get, we, we gotta get more options on the table quickly. Thank you so much, Dr. Blackwell, for spending so much time with us. You're, you know, you're very insightful and thoughtful questions. It's always great to get your uh, expertise and insights. So, so grateful for you spending time with us. Thank you so much. And thank you, Catherine, and to the association for allowing me to co-host as um, a representative of ASV. So I appreciate that so much. Well, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate uh, Catherine, the opportunity to be here, and you had a wonderful co-host today who asked some very pointed and important questions. So come to thank you so much, so much for the questions. And I hope that we will continue on this path, this journey uh, to better organize ourselves as a nation around reaching non-human family members with health care. It will help the shelters. It will certainly help those families. It will help the veterinary service providers. Everybody wins as we do that. So thank you. Well, and I wanna thank you both. This has been uh, educational and thoughtful and uh, we got it straight from the winner of the Abenzino Leadership Award winning Dr. Michael Blackwell. So I um, just really appreciate all the work that the two of you have done in the shelter medicine space and the veterinary space and that you're willing to have these conversations that might feel a little uncomfortable at times but your authenticity and your candor is taking us to a new level in this space and really thank you much um, gratitude to you both so we will hopefully come back and keep talking with you mm -hmm.